I pull over at H-E-B, just kind of regroup and put things back. And I start going through my console. And there's a big old sack of weed in there. <laughs> I'm like... I'm Josh Sigmund. And I'm Bryn Rouse. I'm a mortgage guy with a passion for helping people with their money. And all things business, Bryn is my co-host. And I'm a marketing girl. I am literally obsessed with it. Oh, and Josh has showed me how to save money. Quite a bit, actually. Because of her obsession, I hired her to do my marketing. And we've worked together for 10 years. We launched Sigmund Sense in 2020, a podcast about money. It's a podcast that teach people how to save more, give more, create wealth, and retire early. And we recorded and published 34 episodes. People liked it, and it was so fun. But most importantly, we helped people. So we're excited to announce we're doing a second season. And we're mixing things up. We're moving away from money talks to focus on all things business, leadership, management, team building, book reviews, hiring, firing, operations, motivating teams, lead generation, time management, personality profiling, closing skills, and of course money and marketing. We are inviting you to continue this journey with us and we want your input. What topics would you like to see covered? Email all of your ideas to our podcast email address, sigmundsense at gmail.com. And be sure to click that subscribe button when you visit our channels. You'll get notified when we drop new episodes. Are you ready? Season two, getting down to business. Welcome to Sigmund Sense. Awesome. Well, it's good to see you again. I know. Uh, and I am super excited to hear your story because let me set this one up. So usually we have a little story time in the middle. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to go ahead and start because I'm dying to hear the story. Yeah. It's so uh, I got a call on Sunday night from Bryn saying, I probably won't be at work in the morning because I won't be able to drive there. <laughs> I said, well, did you break your legs? <laughs> So no, my car was stolen. <laughs> so if you've had your car stolen, please go ahead and share your stories in the in the in the please comments. Do. I'd love to hear about it. But I but we just got a call. So this is four days later, and we got a call, or you got a call. I got a call. And got, got the car back. And so I want to know what the hell happened. So so first of all, how the hell did you get your car stolen? What were you doing? So don't buy drugs from strangers. Only buy them from close personal friends and family. It's much safer. Um, I went. I went over to my girlfriend's house um, because <laughs> I bought a bidet. Let's start there. I bought a bidet, and I am so excited. Are you kidding me? This is, that's what. What the hell? I, I did not see this one coming. I bought a bidet. <laughs> my friend's husband's a plumber, and he had some parts that we needed to get my bidet hooked up because I did I because I, I it was just time I wasn't gonna wait any longer for the damn thing to be installed okay so I went <laughs> out <laughs> I can't believe this okay. so I went over I arrived at 9 15 and just jumped out of the car so yes the car was on for everybody that's gonna ask it was on Keys it was in. on but hello that does not mean it is up for grabs okay Clarify. That does not mean it's okay for someone to steal your shit. It certainly because, makes it a whole lot easier. <laughs> correct. But it doesn't mean <laughs> that it's up for grabs. So I pop out. We didn't even go inside. We like stayed in her breezeway. And at 930, I looked at my phone. I'm like, I got to go. I wanted to be home before Walker went to sleep. And I did not get very far because my car was gone. <laughs> and I, had I hate a, to say like you deserve that I, whatever I didn't I don't deserve that is the meanest thing I don't deserve you it you left your car running you've never left your car running ever I carry a gun though what like, would so, that have done I didn't even see him I take stay, it I keep the car within <laughs> close within distance and like I'm like baiting them like Please I didn't come even to my car. see them take it it's not like I was running out <laughs> running after them a gun would have done nothing well, you could shoot them if you don't see them, you can't shoot them. Which is the first problem. Keep your car <laughs> in lion's eye if you leave it running with your purse inside of the car, yes. too, is my yeah. understanding, right? Asterisk, purse was in the car. So I instantly have a panic attack <laughs> in the driveway. No, it's a panic attack because the car was stolen or because you just couldn't remember where you were parking. Because I know that you've... <laughs> <laughs> we were like, I can't remember where there I parked was, my car. There was a real, real <laughs> moment where I was like, wait, I did drive here, didn't I? <laughs> Wait a second. I was like, dude. Are you pregnant again? Like, I mean, is this pregnancy brain? What, what is this? Like, it was so weird that it wasn't there. And so I like, that was my first, like, wait, <laughs> I did drive here, right? Yes, I did drive here. Anyways, so I get a call on um, Thursday morning early. 
from the nicest Sergeant Scott Prater in Eagle Pass, Texas, telling me that he has my car. Which is like two and a half hours away from yeah. San Antonio. Yes, it is. It's two and a half hours away. And it is literally, literally, if you sneeze hard enough while you're at Eagle Pass, you're sneezing on Mexico. It is so close. So he calls me, he tells me he has my car. Uh, he was, um, it was 345 in the morning. My car, which still had my Texas Tech license plate on it and my little B charm necklace hanging from the rearview mirror. Uh, was at a gas station and a 15 year old and a 19 year old were one sleeping in the back seat and the other one was doing something. I don't know. And so it caused him to run the plates and it came up stolen. So he called me and the dudes are in jail. And I said, can I please talk to them? That would have been awesome. Awesome. Let's right. Interview criminals. That'd be fun. I was like, just, he goes, he started laughing. He said, no, I said, just put it on speakerphone. Just go back there, throw it on speakerphone. <laughs> I just have questions. So anyways, they, uh, so I drove down to Eagle Pass because they don't deliver cars once they've been stolen back to you, which I did not know that. Um, so I, I took a trip down there and I learned so much. So basically what happens is uh, th they, they were down there with the intention to smuggle immigrants mm -hmm. and drugs uh, back into the U S and so it's a, the operation is run by the Mexican cartels and they have people that are hired to stake out neighborhoods all over the city. <clears throat> and they would just watch for morons like me <laughs> to leave, <laughs> to, leave, to leave the car, the car. ready to go. Right. They look for, they look for opportunity, not really for morons, but so they see so that they're everywhere. Christmas um, came early, and which is why it only took fifteen minutes because they are they're they're watching, which is also terrifying. Yeah. So, um, but the, the, they did say, you know, they're not they're not all they want is the car. So now, if there's ever any like viol um, violence that occurs, it's on. It's not intentional. It's because somebody happened to be in the car, or you know, or like something right. went wrong, but. Really, they just want the car. So they get the car, then they take it wherever they take it. And usually they tear out all the seats. Usually that's what the sergeant said. He said, I um I can't believe your seats aren't ripped Destroy out. It. Yeah. Usually they make more room for more Yeah, uh, for more bodies. Yeah, more more bodies, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, Molly was not actually that happened to Wes. To it. That is so scary. I can't yeah. I, when, how long ago was that? That last year, I think. Wow. Yeah. yeah his his truck was like a disaster. Yeah, my and when they when they found his, he would the, the truck got pulled over and like fifteen people oh, really? came pouring out and running or something like that. Oh, hot diggity. Yeah. Oh. So you go jet down there, so the I, car is intact, your purse is inside of it. Yes. And what else is inside? <laughs> I, I mean, I opened the door and got immediately stoned as hell because it was like the most weed I've ever smelled in my life. <laughs> it's I'm like, how do you get a car to smell like this much like weed? Like, what did you do? What did you like? So we searched the car <clears throat> with a cop. I had a cop meet me at the tow yard because that was also very sketchy. They changed locations on me right two minutes before we were about to arrive. So that freaked me out. So I called my new best friend, Sergeant Scott, and uh, he sent someone over there to meet me. He searched the car and, because Remember, on, on our way back to San Antonio, we have to go through a checkpoint. A border, a border, border checkpoint. checkpoint. Smelling like weed. That's awesome. <laughs> like, like so much weed. So we're searching. So I found two like butts of of weed, and the officer searched the car. Like I watch him search the car, and he doesn't find anything. He's like, "You're good," and I'm like, F "Okay, what am I gonna do?" When they make, they say, when the dog just start coming through the car. Correct. And he, pull, pull over, over here. Pull, line, please. pull over. What am I going to do? It needs to be something very fast because I'm going to have a heart attack and die if that happens. <laughs> just so you know. Like, what are we going? What's the plan here, sir? And um, he said, you'll be fine. Well, and I said, well, not everybody gets stopped, right? And he goes, you should plan on being stopped. I'm like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> Why should I plan on it? Ah, so 
I am like, okay. So he tells me, here's my phone number. If anything happens, you just give me a call. I'm like, okay, sounds good. So I call my friend Scott, Sergeant Scott too. And I, he said I could do the same thing. I could call him as well. So I'm like, okay, I feel a little bit better. Well, I pull over at HEB, just kind of regroup and put things back. And I start going through my console and there's a big old sack of weed in there. <laughs> I'm like, do better police officer, man. Like what kind of search was that? It's right here. What the hell? So you attempted to go through the... the so, yes. So not only like is the car reeking, but there's weed. He's going to send me through with us <laughs> with drugs in the car. <laughs> like, oh my God. This just happened. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it looks like you made it. Did you just go? Did you just like ru run straight through the, the, the border stuff? And you just That's go for it? exactly how it went. Yes. I just started <laughs> gaining speed and totally like, do not, not stop. stop no matter now, what you do, don't stop. <laughs> and, and then there was two burner phones in my car. There were two burner phones. That's awesome. Because that's how they communicate. And I was like, he was like, well, you, I mean, you can try, you can toss them or you're like, you can keep them. Randy's like, bring them home. I want to see what's on them. And I'm thinking, does, is that going to mean the Mexican cartels are now tracking me? Or am I going to have people flying out of the woods trying to hop into my car because they've been told that Nissan Armada is on the way to get them? Like, I feel like those are all both really bad things. So I gave them to the police officer, like a good person <laughs> should do. That's hilarious. And the cop did turn them on. He's like, let's see what's well, on here. That was a good story. Good way to start the day. Good way to start the day. Molly's but home. But yeah, let's. We want to talk about uh, the next couple subjects, which will take a couple different episodes. Yes. And, yeah. You know, one of the things when I think about making money, saving money, giving money, building net worth, and quite often it starts with like uh, in any business, at least it starts with sales. Yes, it absolutely. It starts with sales. So it really does. It's, uh, yeah, you got to have business. Yeah, gotta, well, there's a million and one great ideas out there that never get off the ground because they've got a great operator behind it, or a great engineer behind it, or a great medical device creator behind it, and then it never gets legs because they don't have a great sales team behind it, right? Yeah. And so um, what we want to talk about is, and we'll kind of un unravel this, is that there's lots and lots of studies, lots and lots of courses on uh, what the best sales people have in common. And so don't just roll your eyes if you're listening. You're like, well, I'm not a salesperson. Uh, yeah, you are. So if you're a child listening, you sell your parents all the time. All the time. If you're uh, a parent. Ooh, I've got a story for you, actually. <laughs> if, you, if you're a parent, you have to sell your kids and your yep. spouse on yep. different ideas of sure. things that they should be doing, you yep. want them to be doing. Yep. Sell your boss on a raise. Sell your employee on why a little bit more work helps benefit not yeah. just the team, but them as well, right? Like yeah, it's everywhere. Sales is sales. But... I'll tell you a story. My daughter just got asked out on a first date and I don't like it. And she's supposed to go. She calmly sat down in my bed when I was asleep <laughs> and said, hi, dad. I just haven't, I haven't talked to you in a while. And I was like, and so I wake up. I was like, oh my God, my eight, 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 my eighth grade daughter like cares enough to just she talk to me. She does love me. She does love me. So she does I, not. They, it's, there's always an manipulation. ulterior motive. It's sales, always, sales. always an ulterior motive. <laughs> so she sat down and she talked for a while and then she flipped by me that one of her good friends just got, just uh, now is dating a boy. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool. And how do you feel about that? She's like, no, I think it's pretty cool. It's like, I think that they're just nice and they're having fun. And, and then she's like, and actually they were wanting to go to a, um, go to a movie. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I mean, if their parents are cool with it, that's fine. And she said, well, they wanted, uh, they invited me and this other kid to a movie too. And I was like, hold on a second. And it took her 30 minutes to unravel this. And she soft sold me so long that it like, I, you know, I'd already said like, if her parents are fine with it, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. So she had soft sold me all the way through it. And at the end of it, I was, she's like, so what do you think? Do you mind if I go? And I said, I love you a lot. My answer, my guts, no, but I would recommend that you wait, that we talk about this in 24 hours because I love you. And I, and she just kept on like what she literally came to me after school yesterday and said, Hey dad, I just want to know like what other questions or concerns or objections literally use those words. What other questions, concerns, or objections do you have to me going on this? She's been listening to the podcast. <laughs> she, or just modeling after me, right? And I said, well, first of all, I have no questions, concerns, or objections because my gut says no. I happen to love you. So I'm battling gut versus emotion right now. You could go I, with him. Uh, Oh, that's a great idea. Well, I'm definitely dropping him, dropping her off. I'm definitely going to scare the shit out of this kid. I'm excited about that. I mean... So, yeah, she won. She sold me. 
It took okay. me, it took two and a half days, but she did sell me. Anyways, I, 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 let's go back to this because what we want to talk about today is step one. Step one. Step one is we always, should have lots of fun. Step yeah. two. Oh my God! It's you're just a great me singer. and you. And that's what it's new kids on to... the blocks, baby. Step, Help me. Step, <laughs> step by step. Okay, is, monster prospecting. Well, that's the that is step one. So <laughs> we we need we can talk about this for thirty thousand years, but uh, the first step that all great sales teams, companies, and people have in common is that they're monster prospectors. They're really good at it. And what I mean by really good at it, it's defined by they create more leads than they can handle. They're great at uh, initial contact. They're great at uh, getting the next opportunity, chasing down, uh, chasing down, and opening doors. They're they recognize when there's an opportunity. They're they're all the other things will fall into place that we'll talk about. Yeah. But they understand that day one, minute one of every single day should be devoted to to prospecting. And I think that they, I think they believe fully that activity breeds activity and that is you know that's one that just can't be overlooked yep. because a lot of times we get we can get bogged down in the details of mm -hmm. prospecting who am i going to call what am i going to say mm -hmm. who am i going to you know who am i going to talk to what if they say this and there's so much self-talk that mm -hmm. one is a total waste of time because all you're doing is delaying the inevitable of picking up the phone and calling or yep. whatever activity just get going something is better than nothing just keep swimming just yeah keep and if swimming. you just you know if if you're always in motion and always mm -hmm. looking and you know no matter no matter where it is it doesn't have to be off of a call list it can be you're always talking and keeping your family and your friends and your sphere of influence up to date about what's happening in that's your right. industry you that's know right. that's activity that's prospecting that's, that's right you know being the person that you know, is delivering the important information well, that they need to know. Well, what's interesting about that too is uh, the best salespeople understand that every single human being walking the face of the earth is a prospect. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that they all are all sellable, and that's True. not a dirty word. Yeah. But they're a prospect until you find out differently, right? Um, you know, a couple things that come to, out of this that we can kind of unravel, but the, when I say like everyone's a prospect, one of the biggest things that I dislike about uh, electronics and cell phones is that there's all this interaction virtually. Yeah. And the skill of reading people mm -hmm. interpersonally, interpersonal skills from verbals and nonverbals is being diminished, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's harder so, to access. Right. So people almost uh, like the whole don't get it in my space at Starbucks or... Um, you know, don't talk to your, the person sitting next to you on a plane. That's a weird thought to me. Yeah, like, I, totally. I, like if somebody's sitting literally six inches from me, I'm for sure going to find it out all their shit. It feels very awkward to not say something. Right. It's like, what? but there's people that like hide from it. It's like, God, God forbid you should look me in the eyes. Cause then I have to talk to you. It's like, Hey, it's because they're shy. Right. I, that's well, what introvert, I in, introverts are for sure. But um, but that's that's a belief system that you have to uh, that you can learn. It mm -hmm. does. It's not necessarily. Like, there's people that are born extroverts and like you want them to shut up. Sometimes I get that, <laughs> but and that's a far I extreme. I totally get that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have you listened to you? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but yes. but on the flip side, there's people that don't uh, don't talk enough. And so you know the question about how do you engage somebody. Um, Ryan Avery, again, we've talked about this in different podcasts, but yeah. uh, it's about having a question and a couple stories, right? Yeah. Uh, and so the best question just to ask is, hey, what's your story? What's you your know, story? What's your story? And people are like, what the hell are you talking about? It's like, <laughs> like well, shit, we're going to sit next to each other for two and a half hours in this plane ride. The like, only what's thing your story? is, is sometimes, you know, you sometimes you really don't want to talk. You're there. Sometimes. You're there for the show that you haven't been able to watch <laughs> for weeks until they find out your story about you trying to smuggle drugs across the Mexican border <laughs> and then they'll listen and they'll engage you because <laughs> I would listen to that story well I would too but not it but it there is a time and you know it, sometimes it's like I just don't want to talk I really do just want to sit here sure. but anyways just I don't know why. I side un note. I understand <laughs> that there are bar, certain people you that you're not going to crack the egg on, but applying that logic that, oh, this person doesn't want to be bothered to everybody is yeah. what I see people cheat more towards. Yes, yes, right? yes, 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 yes. And so, like, what's your story? Shut up. Okay, then game <laughs> over. Like, it's okay. My story, they could say my story is I've, I've had a very hard week and I'm tired and I've yep. been looking forward to this plane ride to close my eyes and yeah. listen to my favorite book. Oh, no problem. Thanks for what's letting me know. Book? What's your favorite Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> so what made your week so hard? So just understand that the best prospectors <laughs> literally think that everyone walking the face of the earth yeah. is potentially a target. Yeah. Uh, in a good way, right? Yeah, I think that's a good thing. And I, you know, I think one thing we have to talk about is why people associate sales with ickiness. Where does that come from? Because I previous sales experiences. Because I love sales. I think it's so fun. Like mm-hmm. I think it's a game, and I think that everybody wins when someone gets to buy yep. something because they like. That, that's a good. These are good things. Product or service. If yeah, it, and, and I think you're spot on. And <clears throat> the best answer that I've heard is the reason why people have a negative connotation on sales in general is because of previous bad sales experiences with bad salespeople. And that always comes back to a salesperson selling them the wrong way, selling them their way, but not the consumer's way. Yeah. Meaning uh, we all have, like some of us overthink. So we need time and space to think things through. We need all the details and we need all the, you know, what, what options and all that stuff. And some people are emotional buyers. And like, if you keep giving all the details, it's like, shut up, dude. I just want to take, like, this is the car I want. Just give me the fucking keys. Right. 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 Um, And then there's all the ways in between. Some people are just so time oriented, like, if you can get me A, B, C, and D, then I'm out of here and we're good. And, we and if you don't, that's okay. But, and that's not a nasty thing, right? Yeah. So it's the matching up and that's the different class we've taught it before with DISC. Yeah. But it's really understanding that you're selling a different, the, the, that person's way. We can dive into that with the close, with the actual sales skills yeah. and the closing skills down the road. But yeah, because I think that comes from what like salespeople having like they're a one trick pony. This yes. is my pitch. This is what I say. Yep. I don't. And they apply that to everybody. Yeah. And, and then I'll, it makes it feel insincere is what it insincere boils, is a great word, actually, is what it boils down to. And it feels like yeah. it, you're getting ripped off or something like. Well, the the I think everyone's programmed to say no to everything first. Right. True. Because they're afraid of making a buying decision or a bad decision. Yeah. Um, and they won't be convinced. And some of us like, believe it or not, like the best salespeople are the easiest to sell. Absolutely. Like, I, I, like if I have a great pitch, I'm like, fuck yes, <laughs> I want that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> sounds like, so good. In fact, I, I have been guilty. I, admit, I, I actually admit I have definitely been on uh, late night TV and bought knives before because it appeared to be those the sharpest. Those infomercials are those, so convincing. Well, some of those salespeople are amazing. And you're like, like wow, like wow, I need, oh I need to gosh. learn some things. So I sit there watching the learn stuff and then I end up spending some money. It's like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? I have that? 15 sets of knives now. I don't know. You should be calling well, that guy to hire him is what you should be doing. That's true. If he was in my state. <laughs> uh, but well, let's go down the road because I, I think that the, the where the monster prospectors come from is it, it starts with quantity of calls. Right. Yeah. It's about like when you think of maybe you're a budding salesperson or you're a budding business, um, what you don't want to do is have all your hopes and dreams and eggs in one basket because you have this great product or service that you find a great outlet that would be a great choice. And you spend all this time and energy to try and land this one deal that's going to make it for you. And they say no to you three months later and you're now out of money and and time and you give up, right? So so you have to start with quantity first. And what is interesting is by making more and more and more and more sales pitches, the quality of the pitch goes up. Mm -hmm. And as you have more business, the quality of the prospects goes up as well because you be, it becomes very obvious who is and who is not a good fit earlier on. Yeah. Uh, It becomes very obvious who's a, yeah, it becomes very obvious who's Mm -hmm. a good personality mesh. Like you've got the two pieces, right? Yeah. There were three pieces really. You're, but you're trying to make sure that the buyer actually has the need that's the first, like, right, if they don't have the right, need, right, right. you could be just, you have the best product in the world, but they don't have the need. The second one is you've got to convince them at some point that your product, your company, your service is the best thing to fill the need. Mm-hmm. But then the third thing that you've got to get to at some point is they freaking like you and trust you enough because I'll tell you that you can have the best product service, but if they don't like you, they're going to go somewhere else. 100%. So you've got three pieces. How about this? Get to. Yep. Are they able to make the decision are they the decision maker mm. you'll be identifying that at some point too people talk for like, days weeks months and years to the wrong person to the they finally wrong get to person. you know what i think that this is good <laughs> let's go ahead and you need to set a meeting with the, with my boss it's like, like why was i talking to you for a year yes so i love that you said that but let's go back to the quantity story yeah uh, there's a basic rule of prospecting in all sales that um Boils down to usually ten appointments. Sorry, ten calls equals three appointments equals one, uh, one deal. And you can apply that however you want. Like 10, 10 conversations can land three appointments, which yeah. of the three will land you one opportunity to to yeah. make money, right? Yeah. 
And it's a basic rule that you'll hear in a thousand different industries. And so I really love my green soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm 23 years old and my, my uh, boss tell, teaches me that rule. Mike teaches me like, Hey dude, you can call 10 people on phone book, which I did at times. And what I would do is I'd set up my little green soldiers. So if you guys recall the green soldiers, if you're older like me, you've got the bazooka guy, you've got the prone position guy, you've got the general guy with his <laughs> binoculars, you've got the grenadier guy, you've got your bayonet guy, you've got your cannonade guy, you've got your what Switch, am I missing? switchblade. Oh, the flag. Yes. How can the I miss, flag. I miss the flag? That's one I forgot. But you've got your 10 guys, you got your 10 green guys. And literally, I, don't think, I, I didn't, actually didn't know they all had different weapons. <laughs> Just, well, so in one. war, you don't just all carry a knife. <laughs> that's how, that's what I carried yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time ever. <laughs> you carried a knife down to Mexico? Yeah. That's awesome. You could have just called me. I would have just given you a couple guns. Go down uh, there. Okay. I, I know where that option is. I feel like a yourself. gun would probably be a bad option. Bad option for you. For me <laughs> you shoot yourself. <laughs> ah, you just drop like, it. I have this over. gun. I have no idea how to use it. So good answer. Wait a second. Let me figure this out. Yeah, that's a good answer. <laughs> don't you need to get training it. if you're going to do that stuff. But <laughs> my point is, I've got these 10 green guys. And I'd sit there for hours, hours and hours and hours, days and weeks and months and years. And all I do is I make my calls. And as I'm, uh, as I'm calling through, I understand just like the book, uh, go for no, right. I understand that the more no's I get, the more, no, I don't want to meet with you. No, I don't need your product. No, I don't like your service. Then the more no's I get through, I'm, I'm getting closer to the next yes. Right. Okay. We have to talk about that. Like, I really do think that that people take sales jobs with the thought that Every call they're going to make, people are going to say yes. And you they, said that. Uh, you've told me that before. Like, I really when you started in this industry. Yeah, like, why we, wouldn't they like, why like would it, music? <laughs> why wouldn't they say yes? Like, why does this job exist if nobody wants to meet with them? Like, that's really weird. And once you change your mind, for, so what that leads to is you get, a, you get so many no's that you start to think there's something wrong with you and that you suck at this job. And <laughs> why would I do this? And this doesn't feel good. And, yep. Um. So changing the mindset to like, hey, just expect everybody to say no. Like you're going to get seven no's, you're going to get 10 no's, and then you're going to get a yes. Yep. Like that's such better expectations. <laughs> I love that. You know, what's funny is I just got a, uh, not too long ago, I got coaching advice from one of my coaches and he said, hey, listen, in my company, everyone's going to be the number one producer or they're going to be, they're going to run the operations one day. Everyone that joins like the receptionist, they're either going to be one day the person that runs the company or they're going to be the number one producer. I said, that's awesome. I was like, how do you decide, distinguish that? And he said, well, the first day I have him walk up to me and uh, I say, and I'll just do it to you right now. He said, uh, ask me if I would work with you. Would you work with me? No. Why? And you pass. Oh, did I? Is that the, is that the, the that is literally why? it. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. And I didn't even prep her for that. The answer was why? Like, why wouldn't you work with me? And that's because <laughs> you are <laughs> expecting to overcome an objection or you're confused of why wouldn't you work with me? <laughs> Whereas most yeah. people or the other half of people, if I say, if I'm the boss, which I am, and then you say, uh, I, I ask this question. No, I wouldn't. You would be, some people are floored and like, oh my God, like, I can't believe it. Now, yeah. does that person have the opportunity to come back later and try again? Yes. Oh, that's good. Right. Then you explain what you were trying to do to, to learn it. <laughs> but it's just, it's that basic of a, of a skill that is easily developed yeah. and understood of. Why wouldn't you work with me? Why would you? If you can't you? get through that piece, you're never going to be a great prospector in general. Well, and here's the other piece to mm -hmm. that. The being a good salesperson is being direct and asking the questions that matter, mm -hmm. and that's the question that matters. Yep. Will well, you work with me? That's absolutely right. Everybody beats around, the bush. beats around the bush and asks all these other things, and people yep. in general don't want to hurt feelings, so they're going to pacify you. Yep. And you're going to think that you have a prospect that's on the hook and that's going to land and you're going to make money. And you don't yep. because they're not going to fucking use you ever. Well, what's really interesting <laughs> past that too is like a lot of salespeople on the flip side don't ask direct enough questions to get a clean yes or a clean no. Fact. Like I'm really, really clear that it's okay to get a no. Like I'm going to try to overcome the objection yeah. a couple times. But at the end of the day... Like, thank you for saving my time and ask me to not follow up and ask me to. But thank you. Right, thank you very they much. They are for doing you a, such a favor. A favor. It's a favor. Yep. Like, we are just not a good fit, Josh. Thank you for thank saying you. that. I appreciate you. Like, uh, but getting to a clean on. no or yes is super important down the road. But <laughs> let's finish this thought on prospecting. So I'm killing my green guys, right? Yeah. So five, six, seven, almost every single time that we get through that, what ends up happening on the flip side is by, you know, I end up setting a couple appointments. I always would end up getting a deal out of it. 
And I'd go kill a couple more green guys. Bring yeah, the guys. There's lots Set them of back lots up. and lots and lots of evidence about this. And I'll tell you that uh, you show me any salesperson that makes more calls than average in their industry, and I'll show you somebody that will for sure succeed. Yeah. Like you can be a shitty salesperson. You yeah. can have really bad closing skills. You have bad products. Yeah. You have bad, pro- bad bad services. If you call enough people, you will for sure do fine. Absolutely. And people stop one of two ways. They stop because I don't like the feeling of being rejected, number one, or they stop because they got one success. They're like, whew, I had a tough day today, man. It took me 15 calls to get my one deal. And it's like, dude, like, then call 100. Uh, and <laughs> it's, it's a weird thing. But what about, they? Uh, do you think they stopped prospecting because they uh, did such a good job that now they have too much business to prospect? I, I do think that that happens. And I would still argue that your business is growing or dying, always. Uh, no matter how good you and your company and service are, and no matter how great your service is or isn't, there's always like, there's always somebody better. Like I believe that. Yeah. Like it's the pursuit of perfection, but it's never perfection. And there's going to be some shiny new star that's going to call on your people. And at some point they're going to cheat yeah. on you. And that's part of it. Right. Like there's, there's salespeople are like, oh my God, I, like uh, I've made more money than I've, than I've ever expected in my life. And it's like, cool, well, you're not Jeff Bezos yet, so just keep on going. <laughs> keep on right? going. Like there's always somebody bigger, better. <laughs> keep prospecting. Right? It's, it, it, but keep prospecting, prospecting forever. And uh, it, the last piece of that puzzle is the reason, and that's a time management thing too, another reason why people don't prospect when they're busy is they don't prioritize it. Right. Like a lot of people get to a point where I don't have to prospect anymore because I've got so many past clients and because I've already done that. I, I served it, my time. And Well, and it doesn't feel like the priority. Right. It doesn't. It truly take doesn't. Care of your existing be, clients. Right. Because you don't want to upset your current clients. Yep. So it doesn't feel like the priority. Why would I go get more when I can't take care of great care of these people? And that's is a the, true. It's a true real wrestling match. And I'll, my answer is then set a minimum. Like at our team. We are blessed beyond belief. We are doing, we're breaking records yeah. almost every year for our team. And at the end of the day, even this year, which we're up like 300% year over year, the metric is two new referring yeah. partners per week. Yeah. Like we need to find two. doesn't mean we're going to work with all, all of them. Right. But it we need to have two new conversations yeah. with two new people, whether they're a CPA, financial planner, attorney, insurance agent, or another realtor every single week. Yeah. And it's because... Somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to retire. Somebody's going to choose somebody else. Somebody's going to slow down their own business. Right. Somebody's going to get out of the business. If you don't, if you don't, if you're always relying on other people to make your numbers, then you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. So creation, it's a, it sounds like a bad answer, but it's the right answer. Creation of more leads than you can handle is what monster prospecting is. And the reason is when you don't have enough leads, where it's easy to handle everything. The problem is, is that you start taking clients that are not a great fit for you. You start doing marginal deals to get the deal because you need the deal because you have too few leads. Oh, that's so true. You start working with and tolerating clients on both sides. Like a client and a referring partner has the ability to fire you you should be able to fire them too. Mm-hmm. And you can't do that if, if, you, can, you're, if, if you, you are barely make, paying your bills, right. right? So if you think in terms of, okay, what's the best outcome or what happens by having too many leads? Well, if it becomes too many leads, now it comes down to the perfect restaurant scenario. Like go to the best restaurant, the best steakhouse on Valentine's Day. You're not going to get a reservation right. that day. You have to reserve it weeks in advance. So what ends up happening is you take the best clients. You take the ones that right. appreciate you the most, that are the best fit for your client, for, for the product or service that you have. And the same thing with referring partners. It's the ones like that actually pass the beer test, <laughs> yeah. right? What's yeah. the beer test? Do you remember what the beer test is? I mean, someone you would have a beer with. Yeah. If you can't <laughs> tolerate sitting down and having a beer or coffee with them, you shouldn't work with if them. If you cringe when their phone rings and it's yeah. them, it's not a it's good not sign. A good, it's not going to last long term, <laughs> yeah, but last. you end up making bad choices and working with those people, Yeah, which you, is usually setting up for failure because you're not going to give your best when you're not are And not your life's going to be miserable. It's going to yes. suck. It yep. is going to suck. You don't have to work with people you don't like and all yep. that. Oh my gosh. So final thoughts on being a monster prospector. What, what else do we miss? Vol- you create the volume. Yeah, create the budget. Then, uh, the, then you work on the quality. Then you work on capping. Yeah. So that's all about more leads than you can handle. And I would say, as far as prospecting goes, don't overthink it. 
truly don't overthink it. Don't yeah. ma- don't perfect the script before you ever pick up the phone. That's right. Don't ma- you know? Don't look and look and research for people to call. Just start calling. That's right. Like just activity, activity, activity. That's- and my mine would be if I were to give everyone something to think about. It's the learn to love the game. It is just a game. Don't take it personally. But if you take it as a game. Like when you walk into a gas station to like see if you can get somebody to chit chat with you and give you give you your life story. When you get on a, in a plane, like like truly engage them yeah. and find out a lot about them. That's the first step towards being a monster prospector. If you need to work on that, just make it a game. Absolutely, and change the expectation to your you do get no's. That's why the yeses are so cool. That's absolutely right. So we're gonna go on to the next step here, and the next step we're gonna talk about in the next uh, podcast. So. If you would like to uh, reach out to us, uh, how do you reach out to us? Yes, tell us your sales stories. Like who likes p- to prospect? Who feels like they're a monster prospector? Who feels like they suck at it? Um, we want to hear all of those things. So um, in any questions you have at sigmundsense at gmail.com, um, make sure you check us out on YouTube and Spotify and Amazon Music and iTunes and all the other places. And next time we'll have another fun story for you. We'll talk to you later. Huh? Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.